It's a great honor to welcome Michael Walzer of the Institute for Advanced Studies to this show once again. Um, he's been on the show twice before. This is his third time, and I've always enjoyed uh, our conversations. Michael, welcome to the show. How are you? I, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Oh, um, just, um, I, I was just introducing you. Um, so yes. uh, how are you? I'm, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> yes, it's always wonderful to have you. So uh, you recently um, published an essay in the website Quillette, uh, which I read frequently, um, is titled Something is Wrong. Uh, the subtitle, which says, it's time for leftists to forego ideology and embrace a people-centered politics. And so much of our discussion that follows will be focusing on that one. Um, may I ask, um, so the last conversation we had was uh, roughly a year ago. So it was before October the 7th. So I wonder, um, where were you on that day? I think I was uh, doing ordinary things. Um, we have moved from Princeton to New York, mm -hmm. which was a difficult move. And by October, we were more or less settled. So I don't, um, I, 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 I got some emails from friends and um, turned on the television. Um, and was, uh, I don't know, the world changed mm -hmm. that, that, that day um, mm -hmm. for, for, for many of us, um, uh, Jews who have, uh, as I have, have lived through the, the creation of the state of Israel and um, watched its... Uh, Growth and prosperity, and um, and followed our friends in uh, Israeli politics, mostly out of office, mostly in opposition, but still, um, still uh, committed to the, uh, the 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 project. Um, and the crucial project was. Um, to create a safe place in the world for uh, for Jews, and October seventh seemed to prove that the project was, uh, if not at, it was in in jeopardy. <laughs> what does um, October the seventh mean uh, to you for non-Jewish people like myself? Well, I, I, um, it, it is the beginning of a war, um, and wars should be of general interest, and um, it is also the, 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 the work of um, a radical uh, religious movement um, displaying its its zealotry and um, the dangers that that zealotry poses. Um, so I would hope that um, that people around the world would 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 look at um, October 7th the way they might look at um, December 7th 41 or um, the the day the Russians uh, attacked Ukraine and seemed to threaten the, the capital. Um, or uh, in, in the United States, like 9-11. Uh, I mean, it was one of those days when I think people everywhere are forced to confront the actual possibility of, um, of evil in the world. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, should be hard. But by this time, shouldn't be impossible. Yes. Um, I suppose um, since you are an authority on uh, just and unjust wars, uh, again referencing a title of one of your famous books, um, how would you uh, assess the justness of Israel's response since? 
well, it, it, the, I judge wars twice, as I as I wrote in that book. Um, the the decision to go to war and then the conduct of the war. I think the decision to go to war was right. I, I think it would have been very hard for any country, any government, after an attack like October 7th, uh, not to respond forcefully. Um, of the conduct of the war, I've had many criticisms um, focused mostly on the, the siege of Gaza, uh, less so on the, the bombing, although I've I've worried in public about that, but I think the um, the 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 decision to uh, to attempt a siege of Gaza um, was both a, a military political mistake and a, and a moral wrong, and I've I've been saying that at uh, in many um, interviews and lectures. Um, think about a conventional siege an ordinary siege in the history of siege warfare. It's a way of fighting without fighting. You surround a city, you cut off the supply of food, and you sit and wait. And the population gets hungry and it brings pressure on the rulers of the city to surrender and the rulers surrender. That's happened over and over again. And it, it it happens because there is some political moral connection between the inhabitants of the city who are hungry and the rulers of the city who are responsible for the welfare of the inhabitants. That's the way a siege conventionally works. But the Israelis knew that Hamas was not that kind of a ruler in, in Gaza and that they did not have a commitment to the welfare of the, uh, the citizens of Gaza, and they were not going to respond to a, to a siege by sharing what supplies they have and when the supplies ran out, um, surrendering. That wasn't going to happen. And, uh, and since the Israelis knew that, um, the siege had to be conducted radically differently than, uh, than conventionally. They had to they had to be ready to provide supplies for the people of Gaza, um, especially when they drove those people out of their homes to avoid the bombing. Um, then they had to send them to a place where there were resources available or resources that could be made available um, to make sure there wasn't um, starvation. Um, and and they failed to do that. Uh, so um, and that's that's more a failure of the of the government than of the the army, which was uh, conducting a war, and the government had had no. Um, well, first of all, it's a far it's a terrible government and an incompetent government, and it did not have any conception of what what was to replace Hamas. Um, insofar as they um, took control of parts of the of the strip, and as soon as they took control of parts of the strip, they had to begin um, providing supplies for the people. Uh, so that's um, that's what I think about the war. <laughs> well, um, I wonder, um, in your view, how does the support for Hamas? Uh, from Gazans continue to be in the above 50% level while we know now that as we've known then that the well-being of the Gazans are the among the least of Hamas's concerns yes um well i don't i don't i don't know how much you can rely on opinion polls conducted in a place like Gaza right now um, the polls do show declining support for Hamas, but still large, uh, considerable support. But um, it would be very dangerous for ordinary Gazans to express, uh, to, to criticize Hamas in any areas where Hamas still has, uh, has any degree of uh, 
of power or ability to uh, to strike against people they who who them um i uh, uh i don't know what would happen in a genuinely free election if if such a thing can be imagined uh in gaza t today but i suspect that hamas would not win there would be some palestinian alternative group that would um that, that would carry um any such uh, uh election um but people do rally i mean these <laughs> the israelis are um the enemy and people will rally to support of uh yeah, even of an organization like Hamas. But it is interesting that its support is much stronger on the West Bank than it is among Gazans who actually are experienced and have experienced the rule of Hamas. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the um, very terrible and very incompetent um, Israeli government that's currently ruling the country right now, which I agree with. Um, now, my question is, Israelis had a chance to vote out um, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his coalition in, I believe, in the year 2021. There was a new coalition, but um, it failed to uh, govern its people for, uh, I suppose, more than a year. And then uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is back in his seat again. So what happened uh, in that uh, previous coalition? It was an election in November of 22. Um, and... Uh... Netanyahu put together a coalition pulling in uh, people from the far, far right, the religious right, um, and they uh, did not win a majority of the popular vote, but because of divisions on the left, they won a majority in, in parliament. Um, and uh, and it, it is, as you say, a, a, a terrible government. Um, and this government immediately um, launched uh, an, an attempt to reconstruct the Israeli government, essentially weakening the power of the courts, um, which set off an incredible um, uh, uprising of liberal and secular uh, Israelis, which I thought was on the verge of, of victory. Mm -hmm. For October seventh, um, I, I, uh, I mean, I mean, victory simply in the sense that uh, so much of the country had been mobilized, and they were they were able to call general strikes, which paralyzed the country, and I think the government would have fallen. Um, October, October seventh changed everything. Um, this government then became the the, the wartime government of uh, of of Israel. Um, they remain incredibly unpopular, and there continue to be demonstrations. But um, the country is uh, traumatized, and um, it's very hard to to put together um, anything like a left liberal coalition. Uh, that can that can bring the country um, to a halt the way um, the uprising before October seventh was was I think doing or on the brink of doing. Um, the country is bitterly divided, and um, those divisions um, can't really be worked out while a war is going on. Um, and every terrorist attack is a uh, strengthens um, the right, and I think in every case, in every government, in every country, um, and and the right has been strengthened in the sense that even the people who want to replace this government are not um, willing at this moment. To um, consider ending the uh, the occupation of the of the West Bank um, because they fear that it it could become a base for um, attacks like uh, Hamas's attack 
in October. So um, we have to hope, what I hope, what my friends in Israel hope is that, that the government will eventually be brought down. There will be elections and there will be some kind of center right, but relatively decent and competent government. And that will open the way for um, a rebuilding of uh, some kind of liberal left anti-occupation. I'm not talking about left in uh, socioeconomic terms. I'm talking about left in terms of the occupation. Um, uh, some way of, uh, of moving toward uh, self-determination for the, the Palestinians, which I think is the necessary uh, the necessary condition of any of any genuine stable uh, peace. Yes. Um, so going back to the uh, American left, uh, which uh, you are a part of. Now, my general question would be: um, What do you believe is the role of a left uh, wing in a democratic society? Well, in a democratic society, the left, um, like the right, competes for power. And um, it should be driven in this competition by um, a commitment to establish a, 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 a more egalitarian society than the one that, that, that currently exists, um, a society more accommodating to um, to minorities, um, a society more um, um, encouraging the political participation of, um, of its citizens through various forms of local of decentralization and um, local rule um the, the the task of the left is to um in a democratic society is to seek to govern on behalf of the people who who are in trouble who are um uh, uh, who, who are uh, i'm trying to avoid the word oppressed because in many democratic societies there isn't exactly anything like real oppression. Um, the people who are out, who are neglected, who are not receiving the the, the educational benefits or the um, health care that they need. The purpose of the left is to help the people in trouble. And there are always people in, in trouble. <laughs> yes. I suppose uh, the term that can be used is disadvantage, but um, that I think you mentioned the word oppress, and I wonder um, how should the the left express its concerns for the genuinely oppressed peoples of the world? Um, I, I suppose the Uyghurs, uh, the Rohingyas, and, and it, to a, a certain extent the Palestinians, for example. Well. Um... An American left would favor a foreign policy uh, that worked on behalf of um, oppressed people around the world. Um, that's uh, that's a very hard thing to do in a society of of sovereign states, and it requires um, diplomatic finesse. And sometimes the real work shouldn't be governmental. It should be um, the work of um, left-wing political parties uh, in in solidarity with with each other. An old old notion of what left internationalism uh, should should be like. But where there is government intervention in the uh, in a case like uh, the Palestinians, the American left should have been working toward. The creation of a of a Palestinian state alongside uh, is Israel. Um, 
and that was the the stated policy of um, successive American governments pursued sometimes with more energy and sometimes with with less. Um, but uh, as I said, we are also committed. The left is committed to the existence of a society of um, of sovereign states ruled by their own people and not subject to um, foreign foreign rule. Um, that's the great difficulty now for my friends in uh, in Israel. They want American pressure on this awful government. Um, at the at at the same time, they um, they want uh, they don't believe that Israel should be uh, a puppet state like Bulgaria with the old Soviet Union. That that shouldn't be the relationship. Um, and it's uh, it's not always easy to figure out how to um, how to exercise uh, benevolent influence um, across uh, the boundaries of of, of sovereign states. Um, I've argued in favor of humanitarian intervention when there is an actual massacre going on, but even that is only possible when the state where the massacre is going on is a small state without an army of its own or without an ability to resist intervention. Um, there's no possibility for military intervention on behalf of the Tibetans or of the Muslim people in, uh, in Western, Northwestern China. Um, so yes, I am an internationalist who recognizes the limits of internationalism. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is a dilemma that plagues um, all Americans from left to right, right? Whether the um, plight of uh, an oppressed people abroad justifies um, intervention, even militarily, by the United States, amongst others. Um, you know, we we recently celebrated the 80th anniversary of D-Day. So I think that was a very clear cut case of um, an oppressive force and the need to, uh, I guess, uh, obliterate it militarily. So um, how do you how do you think the the lab uh, has wrestled with this dilemma so far? Like not just in the context of Israel Palestine, but perhaps of Russia Ukraine amongst other cases. Well, the left is. Um is is divided there's a substantial portion of the left which um uh, is uh, uh incapable or unwilling um to uh to recognize um uh aggression um when it isn't um american aggression <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, the, the response of the left to Ukraine, well, there is the social democratic left across Europe supported the Ukrainians as, as, um, as my friends here did. Um, and the farther left had an, a terrible position. Um, they, they blamed, um, the West they blamed the expansion of NATO as a, which they say threatened Russia and led to this uh, attack. They justified the attack or apologized for it or mostly just tried to shift the blame for it. Um, uh, I, I think they, they willfully got things wrong, terribly wrong. Um, and they were supported by um, realists, people calling themselves realists who tend to be conservative about international politics, um, arguing that um, the best way for to peace is for the Russians to have a, a sphere of influence in, um, in uh, Eastern Europe, the way the United States has, they say, 
a sphere of influence in um, the Caribbean or Central America. Um, and forgetting, I mean, people on the left who have that position have, tend to forget that we are officially, as leftists, opposed to an American sphere of influence. <laughs> in uh, the Caribbean and, uh, and Central America. Um, yeah, it, is, uh, it, it has really been a, 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 a appalling, I think. To some extent, the, 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 brutal, the brutal conduct of the war by the Russians has, um, has quieted some of the far left um, of political support that Putin had at the beginning. Um, and the realists are still arguing that uh, Biden should meet with Putin over the head of the Ukrainians and negotiate a, a settlement which would conceive, concede um, Russian influence in, uh, in a substantial part of Eastern Europe. Yes. Um, one of my concerns, and I wonder if you share this concern, is that if you proclaim your support for Israel in the United States, chances are you'd gain more friends from the right than from the left. Whereas um, I believe at least support for Israel is is uh, some is a position that you can take regardless of whether you're on the left or on the right, because you are recognizing the the right of a sovereign state to exist amongst other sovereign states. So uh, I wonder to what extent is that something that you are concerned about? Well, yes, I, I am, I am uncomfortable to find um, um, uh, the national rally in France uh, being, uh, finding support, uh, thinking of itself as a supporter of Israel and um, Israeli ministers coming to uh, to uh, thank the leaders of the national rally for their support. Uh, that, all that makes me very uncomfortable. Um, there are, uh, there is a, a version of right-wing politics, um, which is pro-Israel and at abroad and anti-Semitic at home, um, which uh, some right-wing Israelis seem um, to think is okay, so long as they are supported in uh, in Israel. Um, I agree with you. Uh, this should not be a right-left issue. Um, and I think it really isn't on the center left and the center right there is pretty strong support i think for for israel yes. um I, uh, I i worry a great deal about the coming visit of netanyahu to the american uh, congress um there's a letter in the new york times today signed by leading israelis former prime ministers and heads of uh, the Secret Service and leading intellectuals, writers, all urging the U.S. Congress not to to send to revoke the invitation, um, because this will this will help him at home, and his politics are are, are a danger to um, to Israel. So, um, and we we on the center left won't know what to do on that day because there will be massive pro-Hamas people outside of Congress shouting their slogans about globalize the intifada and from the river to the sea. Um, and we who would also want to protest the visit can't be there among them. Um, so what do we do? Where do we go? Um, it's a little bit like me writing for Quillette. 
um, because I, I I no longer can write for the magazine I edited for so many years, uh, which has carried pe pieces on uh, that are literally pro defending Hamas. Yes, and I suppose you're referring to Descent, the magazine. Yes. <laughs> yes, which is um, which brings me to uh the events of uh, Columbia University. Some. Uh, some months back, and I think there are parallels to be made between what happened there and what happened uh, at the same area in 1968. Um, there was uh, an international crisis abroad with America's involvement in Vietnam, and there's a, uh, I suppose, a racial crisis at home, and one can say in 2024 the same thing is happening, and I, I wonder if. Um, that sort of radicalization um, based on, say, domestic discontents also influences um, the Columbia protesters of today in their protests uh, against um, Israel's actions. Yes. Well, the um, uh, as you know, I, in my article, I have a reminiscence about um, anti-war politics in the in the sixties. University politics then, um, there, there was, um, uh, as you say, it, it was a combination of um, anti-war and um, anti-racist or pro-black uh, politics in the United States. Um, and on the camp in, at Harvard University, where I then was, um, one of the demands of the protesters, in fact, the demand that was most fervent, most passionate, was to create a, a black studies department at Harvard and allow students a, a voice in the selection of uh, a faculty. Um, and in some ways, that, uh, that there was more passion there than about the war, uh, the war itself. Um, I think these protests seem focused almost entirely on um, the Palestinians, although there are there is the doctrine of intersectionality, which connects the Palestinians to every other um, group that is or calls itself uh, 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 oppressed. Um, yeah. There are resemblances, but also differences. Um, and also, it was an American war, not the not the war of an American ally back in uh, in 60, 68, 69. Um, yeah. Well, I've written, as you know, about the uh, the differences within the anti-war movement in the in the sixties, um, and I suspect there are similar differences now, although they seem to be submerged um, somehow. The, uh, the the simple expression of support for the Palestinians, for Palestinian self-determination, for a two-state solution, that kind of politics doesn't seem to be visible um, on the campuses. You mentioned also that the protests of 68, um, I, I suppose, did not help the war cause, but instead it um, enabled the rise of the right represented by Richard Nixon. And I wonder to what extent are the protests of this year, 2024, what embolden the rise of well the current right, which is well both you and I are appalled by. Um I I do think uh that um the the Trump or Republicans are 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 trying to build on these uh the the, the protests and the response of mm -hmm elite universities of um which are regarded as liberal universities um yes i think the uh probably the um the, the protests will play in november 
in ways that help uh, that help the right, as they did in uh, in sixty eight. Um, yeah. The the um, yeah. I, 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 there were quite specific ways in which the um, the anti-war protests helped the right, which may not be relevant in this uh, situation. Um, we were we were protesting a war in which American soldiers were were dying, and um, and we we did not succeed uh, until Veterans Against the War, an organization that developed later, um, we did not succeed in in, uh, in 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 reaching out or talking to um, the the parents of those uh, soldiers. I think we did very badly in that uh, in, in that effort. And and I think we contributed to the drift rightward of the working class that that began in the late late sixties and uh, exists today is still a, a a problem today although there were many intervening reasons for it but <laughs> yeah of course um the the war in Vietnam hits close at home right I'm. I was born in Hanoi. I'm Vietnamese, um, and I wonder, from reminiscing from your time uh, witnessing how the war unfolded and unraveled, what do you suppose um, the U.S. Army or the U.S. government could have done differently? I suppose for the war to be more just, or the I guess the threat of Vietnamese communism be averted. Well, I'm not sure it it it, it could have been averted. Um, the governments we supported in in, in Saigon um, were simply not uh, capable of um, of of rallying the countryside. Um, they were they were authoritarian. They were corrupt. The army that uh, they produced was uh, was unnecessarily brutal in uh, in the villages of, of Vietnam. Um, I don't know what we could have done. It's another example of the problem of um, sovereignty. Um, we 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 wanted to create governments <laughs> that we could direct, and we failed to uh, to do that. And and once the Viet Cong had won what was called the battle for hearts and minds in the countryside, um, then the war was lost, and it was you had to acknowledge the loss and and hope to negotiate a settlement that might have included some protection for the people of uh, of South Vietnam. Um, I think that should have been uh, the goal. Um, but look, um, I, uh, had, had we succeeded in creating a, a democratic government in Saigon, um, a government that that could actually um, uh, rally support in in rural Vietnam, which was most of Vietnam. Um, had we succeeded in doing that, I don't think I would have opposed the war. Mm -hmm. I can't. I, I I can't say for sure what I what I would have thought if I was thirty years old. Um, but had had it been an intervention on behalf of a, of an embattled democratic government um, facing a conquest and replacement by an authoritarian or totalitarian regime, yeah, I would have I would have been, had a very different position in, in American politics at that time. One thing I also. I'm also curious about is um, 
the extent to which um, um, a certain radicalized left wing of the 60s, they seem to have an idolization of um, third world revolutionaries, nationalists, authoritarians alike. Of course, um, Vietnam's is Ho Chi Minh is one of them, but um, there are people like Mao and Castro and uh, Che Guevara and the African leaders, Nasser, uh, and I suppose Arafat was among them too. Um, what what about these figures uh, that captivated the the attention or even the adoration of um, I suppose what you'd call the ideologically driven left of that time? Yes, yes. Well, there needed to be a replacement for the uh, European and American proletariat, uh, which obviously was not going to rise up uh, and create a, a communist or regime. Um, and they found that replacement in um, in the third world. Um, they would have said in the in the masses of the third world, but it turned out to be in the people who claim to be the leaders of um, the third world populations um, and who claim to be leftists and were anti-imperialists and anti-colonialists and hostile to the West. All that um, made them uh, exciting uh, candidates for um, support from the the uh, the Western left, um, and and again there were reasons to support an anti-colonial struggle, um, but it also always should have been a, a critical support. Um, it's what we at Descent tried to do in, with the Algerian uh, uh, revolution. Uh, we, we thought there should be an independent Algeria, and we thought that uh, the politics of the FLN required left-wing criticism. And um, I think most people on the left just thought that was a contradictory position, and how would you hold a position like that when it was obvious that the FLN required our Western leftist support? Um, and it was exactly that that critical relationship that we also tried to adopt toward um, uh, the PLO. Well, of course, um, you know, in contemporary times, that sort of uh, bizarre idolization has migrated to the right. You see a lot of right wingers uh, holding people like Putin and uh, Netanyahu and Hungary's is Orban on a unreasonably high pedestal. And I wonder to to what extent is that st does that stem from um, a discontent at uh, at the domestic political slash social situation. Yes. How do you how do we explain an admiration for for authoritarian figures? Um, sometimes a, a populist authoritarianism, and sometimes simply a very old fashioned uh, authoritarianism. And in Putin's case. Uh, Church, church supported, <laughs> um, uh, ordinary, just ordinary right wing, far right wing repression uh, with religious support. I don't know how um, people on the left can admire that unless they believe um, <clears throat> the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's a uh, the enemy of Western capitalism or Western civilization um, is the friend of uh, the Western left or versions of a far left. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't find that an attractive politics, and I'm not sure 
how it will fa fare in Western Europe. Um, Maloney in Italy has forced to, to move somewhat toward the center and act actively to support the, the, um, the Ukrainians. Um, and uh, Marie Le Pen talks so radically different from her father. Um, I, I, I still am, I still think we need to watch and not be, not be too sure about what is going on in, in that kind of right wing politics in, uh, in, in Europe. It has to be opposed right now. Um, but it may not be as terrifying <laughs> um, as it might have looked some years ago. Yes. Um, um, well, uh, I, because of my uh, current position, um, I live here in Budapest. Um, I suppose I have the privilege of sitting in the front seat of this uh, current political theater. Yes. And what do you make? Um. I've always thought that there is a a strong undercurrent of reaction towards um towards what they deem to be um liberal liberal globalism uh, best represented by the European Union. So mm -hmm. the the biggest battleground of uh, the European right is is the concept of Europe itself, whether it is a a federation of nations or a series of separate nations with their different traditions and cultures. Um, and, and well, of course, uh, the, um, British exit from, uh, the European Union triggered this, um, wave of, uh, right-wing reaction. And of course, uh, one has also has to account for the migration of, uh, Middle Eastern peoples into the European continent. There's a very big, uh, right-wing reaction towards that. And in particular, mm -hmm my in the current country of my residence hungry too yeah yeah okay. um yes and i am um <laughs> both a federalist and a pluralist um i i think it should be possible for um for europe to be a, a federal union um with uh, combined policies shared with collective policies on issues like environment and uh, collective defense, and, um, but with a lot of room for local traditions and cultures. Uh, I don't, maybe that's you, utopian. Um, I am also a pluralist here in the US. Uh, a soft multiculturalist. I mean, I don't want to, to carry an identity card that lists me as Jewish or Russian or whatever. Um, I don't want, uh, but I do want um, a, a world in which uh, Americans can be hyphenated Americans and um, and live. Um, both within particularist communities and be American citizens, engaged American citizens. And I would want to be, if I were a, a, a pole, say, or, a, well, a pole, my, my ancestors came from what is now Belarus, so that's not immediately relevant, but Pol is, Poland is where, is the closest um, so I, I think that I should be able to be a citizen of Europe, um, participating in Euro-wide elections, dealing with certain issues, and at the same time, a, a, a lover of Polish history and culture. Um, if, if that's not possible, then I think we are in deep trouble if we have to choose between between um, a, a centralized bureaucratic Europe 
um, and a, um, a Europe of uh, sovereign and, and often hostile states. Yes. I don't think it should be the choice. Yes, um, of course, uh, as you may know, um, there was a recent uh, Europe-wide election. Um, I believe it was on June 9th, as of this recording, it was two or three weeks ago. And it seems that um, the European Parliament, um, in within the European Parliament, the right wing is um, it's uh, uh, holding a major majority, a major advantage. And I, I suppose um, within the continent of Europe, within the nations of continental Europe, um, the concept of a nation is somewhat different from that of the United States, um, whereas um, the United States always has a, con a conception of a nation as um, uh, something that contains uh, a multitude of peoples and cultures and religiosities. Um, the same cannot be said for the countries that I live in now, Hungary or perhaps even Germany or France. Um, you know, there's the, um, I, I suppose, uh, uh, the crude way a crude way to put it would be a kind of blood and soil nationalism and um so so such a such a cultural presuppositions provide fertile ground for ultra nationalist movements that we see across the european continent you know france's national front for example or i've day in um in germany Yes, yes. And um, I think the immigration issue that you mentioned is probably key here. Um, and I think the um, the fact that uh, EU policies on migration, uh, which produced uh, uh, a million Poles living in in the in the UK, uh, had a lot to do with uh, with Brexit. Um, and exactly how you deal with that, I'm, I don't know. Um, I think climate change is going to produce more and more refugees. Um, we, we are, we will soon be facing uh, in the United States, if the forecasts are right, millions of people moving from the sea coasts inland that needing to be Accommodated, they will be fellow Americans, not foreigners, but they will still be uh, uh, people who need um, care. Um, I uh, and and when similar people are coming from outside, uh, it is going to be very very difficult. Um, a massive effort to uh, make life possible for people where they are uh, is what uh, the international left should be advocating now. Um, a kind of universal Marshall Plan. <laughs> uh, but um, yes, I, I, uh, I recognize that difference. It's also um, true of Israel, that Israel is a country more like um, those European countries that you described with an 80% Jewish uh, majority. Um, and with a lot of people who want um, that majority to dominate every aspect of the national life. Um, So what's but what's also true, I, I certainly true of the Jews in Israel. There are so many divisions among the majority within the majority um, that you've got to work out a, some kind of pluralism. And once you have a denominational Judaism, which is what we have in America now, um, once you have a denominational Judaism, you can live in peace with Muslims. And uh, if you can live in peace with Reformed Jews, you can live in peace with Muslims and, uh, and Christians. Um, so the, the left has to fight for um, pluralism. But it, it, it doesn't have to be an, an anti-national pluralism. That's, I, I've tried to write about that. 
you, you can have a, 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 a state that reflects in its national holidays, for example, its official holidays, it reflects particular national or ethnic history. You can have that so long as people feel free to celebrate alternative holidays of their own. Um, I have never felt in America, well, as you say, America is different, but I can go to the 4th of July holidays or the Memorial Days when we honor America's dead, which is uh, the most patriotic of holidays. I can participate in those holidays and um, and still celebrate a Jewish New Year or a Passover in my family and in my community. Um, that has to be possible in other countries too. Yes, and I suppose it's always a, a dilemma for every immigrant group um, in that um, to what extent should you pay a, a certain tribute of patriotism towards uh, your adopted home country while still maintaining the cultural traditions from the countries that you left from? Right. And if the if the host country is welcoming, uh, there sh it should not be difficult to uh, to celebrate its uh, its history because it's that history that produced the, the welcome. Yes. Um, now, this is very funny, but I remember there was a skit in um, Larry Davis's show, Curb Your Enthusiasm, where within the neighborhood that Larry and the others are living in, they open a, a Palestinian chicken shop. And although um, there's a, a version because of the conflict, um, Larry David really likes the chicken that they, they serve there. Um, and I wonder, um, is that something that can happen in America where a Jew and a Palestinian can, can sit together and have either chicken or certain Jewish dish, dishes? Well, it, it, it was happening, it can happen in Israel. There are groups called Side by Side and um, Working Together and Hand in Hand, um, all of which bring uh, uh, Jews and, 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 and Arabs, Jews, mostly Muslim Arabs together. Um, it may be harder in the United States <laughs> than it was in Israel before the war. Um, there are a lot of, of, of interfaith uh, efforts. Um, yes, but there's also something that happens in America uh, maybe makes us different. Um, sociologists have written about this. There is a process of, you might think of it as the, the Protestantization of Jews and Catholics and now Muslims. Um, by that I mean um, the the what used to be the um, the exilic community, the semi-autonomous uh, Jewish community in um, early modern or medieval Europe um, becomes uh, a congregation with a men's club and a women's auxiliary, <laughs> and um, and that happens less so, but. It, happens in a Catholic parish. And now, according to sociologists, it is happening in mosques. The mosque is becoming something like a Protestant congregation um, in America. And that does make living together e easier. Um, now, uh, there's also the phenomenon in, in the U.S. that the early Arab immigration was almost entirely Christian. Mm -hmm. So we have more Christian Arabs, and we're now beginning to have more and more Muslim Arabs. But the early immigration was Christian, which probably made their assimilation into American life um, much easier than it is for Muslims in um, Arabs in uh, in 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 Europe. Mm -hmm. um, well, 
Yes. Um, you know, um, there was an essay that I read from you uh, that you wrote roughly like five or six decades ago now. Um, it's called The Obligations of Oppressed Peoples. I found it in your collection of essays, uh, Obligations, which is I find to be phenomenal. Um, I believe you recently, um, I guess, revamped that conception in an Atlantic piece. And yes. I'd like to hear more about it. Um, so what do you suppose are the obligations that are bestowed upon the people who find themselves uh, under oppression? Yes. Well, they are probably different in, in democratic settings. Um, I wrote the piece originally about... Um, about um, black communities in the United States, um, w w where I thought the obligations are the obligations of um, of citizens and um, civil disobedience was uh, um, civil disobedience with their people committed to the civility of civil disobedience was uh, one of the expressions for that kind of. Um, uh, a protest movement that was uh, respected the obligations. Um, obviously, any kind of, uh, of of terrorist politics violates the obligations of democratic citizens, even of um, citizens who are segregated, or discriminated, or oppressed. Mm -hmm. um, in a case of um, like the Palestinian case, where they are not operating um, in a fully democratic society. I mean, Arabs in, Pal in Israel are operating in a democratic or near democratic society. They, they participate in elections. They have newspapers, parties, journals, universities. Um, but uh, the, the PLO in uh, in the West Bank or Hamas in Gaza is obviously not operating in a in a democratic setting. Um, here, the oppression is much more extreme, um, and I think the major obligations of, um, of a group like Hamas are to their own their own people, to the well being of their own people. Um, I also think that as um, uh, as uh, insofar as they are also human beings, they uh, they they have to reject uh, terrorism as a as a political tactic, but not to reject. They don't have to reject um, violence if it's directed against legitimate military targets. Um, but the I I argued in that Atlantic piece that the crucial obligation of um, of Hamas was to work toward the creation of a, a, a Pal Palestinian self-determination, um, which which would mean um, joining forces with uh, other um, uh, non-Hamas um, Palestinian groups and reaching out to uh, the Israeli liberal left um, and working toward the creation of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Um, that that seemed to me to be, uh, if 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 you are, if you are acting on behalf of the people of Palestine, which Hamas is, Hamas doesn't always say that. Hamas is acting um, in defense of Islam. Um, and in defense of um, of Arab lands against the invaders of Arab lands, that's a, um, and I, I don't know what obligations uh, are imposed by those kind of Islamic or Islamist um, uh, by that kind of politics. But if you are operating on behalf of a group of people, then you have to work toward systematically commit yourself to the the actual well-being the concrete well-being of those people that's the crucial obligation it seems to me of any left groups claiming to represent the oppressed 
<laughs> so um, finally, um, of course, the uh, the appeal of um, Trump and the right wing currently is the idea that they are the ones standing up for certain disadvantaged members of the society, what they call the silent majority or the moral majority, so-called. Um, uh, I wonder to what extent can um, a, I suppose, people-driven left, as you call it, um, to what extent can they appeal to these sentiments uh, by, say, people who are planning to vote uh, Republican in this election year? Yes. Well, the, the 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 people that we most need to appeal to are the people who think they have been passed by, they have been forgotten, um, especially in the, the former industrial areas of the American uh, Midwest. Um, and the, the adoption of neoliberal economics by many Western by many American liberal Democrats was, I think, a disaster. It was a way of literally walking away from those uh, from those people. Um, you, you, you know, the, the um, crucial divide in American society today, according to many of the sociologists and pollsters, is between people at, with different levels of education, not with different levels of, of income. Um, it's not a class politics. It's a some kind of cultural politics. And um, that's a replacement that, that the left has great difficulty uh, given our committed materialism. It has it, it has difficult that poses difficulties for us, and Biden has made a genuine effort to return to a kind of New Deal liberalism, which is the American version of social democracy, and to reconnect with working Americans, especially working Americans who are finding it difficult to to work. Um. He's that he he is trying to reconnect. Um, he is hampered by a an uncooperative Congress and, a, and an uncooperative Supreme Court. But I I think that we we do have to find our way back to thinking about um, the material interests of the people who have been left behind and that. And also responding to their sense of having been left behind, um, somehow affirming their their importance in the um, in the American the overall picture of of American society. We have to bring them back, um, and that has to be primarily an economic uh, project. And I think Biden understands that, but he has only very limited powers to uh, to deal with it. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much <laughs> once again, Michael Walter, for joining the show. Okay, thank you.